I am super, super excited and over the moon to have an interview with Russell Todd. Um, You know him, horror movie fans from Friday the 13th Part 2. He knows You're Alone and Chopping Mall. Um, He was also in uh, Where the Boys Are 84. Is that the right title? That is correct. Yeah, it was a remake of the 1961 film. Right. Uh, Francis, yes. And um, you were in Another World also. Yeah, played Dr. Jamie Frame for three yes. years. Yes. <laughs> I, I love, uh, I, I was a big Days fan, but I did watch Another World as well. So, um, yeah. uh, so we will mostly be discussing Friday the 13th Part 2 with a little bit of He Knows You're Alone. I hope that's okay. I know you're probably asked questions about this movie more than anything else, but. All good. <laughs> um, so that's good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, what was the process of being cast for the movie? For Friday the 13th, um, I believe I saw this actually in Backstage. Are you familiar with that uh, newspaper? Yeah. yeah. I saw an audition call in Backstage, and um, I believe I had an agent. I did have an agent at that time in New York, and I was living in New York where they were cast. Mm-hmm. But um, I figured I saw that, and I just wanted to get in on that. So I contacted them, and I went myself. They wanted to see me. And uh, I read with the casting director, and they wanted me to come back. And I read again, I believe, with Steve Miner, the director. Mm-hmm. Watching. And it was like a day or two later I, I was cast. So it was a very quick process. And I was really excited about it because, like m- most people, had seen the original Friday the 13th. And right. It, yeah, it was- but it, it came out so so close to the first one. I, it almost surprises me sometimes that so many – like it. You know, they started re- recording part two really quickly after part one. Yes, they had a success, and uh, they wanted to get out there right away with a with a follow up. So right. I, I was excited because number one was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I was scared by it, and uh, it was exciting. And uh, to be able to do and some something like that and follow it with a sequel was was a was a thrill. So, so I was happy to get cast. Well, it is my favorite. Of the series, you're just saying that because I'm no, I, I'm really not. My top three are two, are two, four, and seven. Seven is because of nostalgic reasons, but uh, four, you know, because of Crispin Glover and Corey Feldman. I love Crispin Glover, so. Uh, but two was the is for me the most rewatchable of all of them. That's great. That's great. A lot of people say that, but uh, you know, when you mentioned four, uh, as you know well know, being a fan of it, at the beginning of four, you see a lot of deaths from other ones. Right. Yeah. Four death again and i i didn't even know because i hadn't seen four i didn't know that my death was lifted from two and put into four uh-huh. and as actors we you know we love and we live on our residuals but there right. were no residuals coming for years and years and years and i said what's going on so i contacted the screen actors guild and they contact contacted paramount and they said well he's not in four uh yes i am look at it you put me in four <laughs> and they wouldn't do anything until uh, they had me prove I was in four by literally looking at a copy of four and sending them time codes to say when I was in it. Oh, my gosh. Because it's so ob- I mean, it's so obviously you. I mean, it's it's the scene. I mean, they, they <laughs> knew, it too. I mean, of course they knew it. They lifted my scene to put it in four. But for some reason, you know, because it involved more residuals. And then they started paying residuals on on four as well, even for that little, you know, scene. Well, at least you got at least, you know, at least you got it, I guess, eventually. <laughs> Yes, eventually. And they paid it from the you know beginning, too, which was nice. But, you know, their residuals are not are, are very small for a, a tiny thing like that. Uh, right. But do you still I mean, you do still get residuals like, ba- you know, they just came out with that big uh, that big box set and stuff like that. You Do you still get residuals yes. from things like that and stuff? Yeah, residuals from sales of the DVDs will also get uh, residuals from, you know, it shows up somewhere every Friday the 13th somewhere. Right. So, yeah, for, for in perpetuity, we get residuals for, for the one we were in, which is nice. Yeah, that is, <laughs> even though it sounds like they didn't want to give it to you. But <laughs> <laughs> Boy, yeah, they didn't. <laughs> uh, so, OK, so, you know, your your death is not, you know, at the beginning of the movie by any means, but it's not, you know, near the end. One of the early ones. So um, how long were you on set? 
I think I worked on the show only about three weeks. I think everyone was there about six weeks, but I think they brought me in later. Uh, of course, I had to be there for all of the group scenes um, at the cabins, out by the lake, uh, at the, the main lodge. Um, so I was in you know, a number of those scenes, but because I am one of the earlier jazz, I wasn't there for a lot of it. So when I look at the movie, especially the first time, of course, I, I saw things I had no idea were being filmed. Um, mm -hmm. and, and people would ask me to comment and they go, I'm sorry, I was never there. I couldn't tell you. Yeah, <laughs> but you can definitely comment on, the, you know, your scene, especially because it is kind of the same death scene that you have and he knows you're alone. So you you're very familiar with it. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that a funny coincidence to die the same way? I think, you know, they did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got cast, I said, you know, I did die that way in another film prior to this. With Tom they're and, like, uh, yes, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know it, but uh, yes. <laughs> it doesn't sound like something I could do. Like, I just don't think I could hang upside down that long. <laughs> I think I was upside down maybe 45 minutes to an hour. That's a lot. That's a really yeah. long time. There, <laughs> Especially, there no cell phones crew. or anything. So. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there was someone on the crew that was kind of holding my back up so I wasn't completely just, you know, vertical. Right. And, um, yeah, but then that we only had one take on that death scene. Uh, so I'm glad we got it. And In fact, I just recently, because we just did all, we just recently did all the, uh, the extras for the new uh, DVD set coming out. So they recorded a number of the actors from part two. As you know, we as we watched the movie, we all spoke about you know our remembrances of shooting it, which was great. So that'll be a part of the DVD set. But on there, uh, they also showed us some clips uh, that were cut from the movie. Where the yeah, because it was heavily edited. Correct. I mean, they had to cut a lot of those death scenes. They did because once the guy up above me had a had a canister, he was pumping the blood. Once the guy slit my throat. Uh, the blood started flowing. He was pumping, pumping, pumping. That stuff was rolling down my face really quickly and into my eyes. It was really a bloody mess. But wow, they, yeah, they cut all that. But I had never seen that footage. But I got to see it the other day, which was cool. Did you get a picture of yourself after that that you could send to your parents? Because I, I know in an interview I heard you talk about how you were like, "Well, my death scenes today," and they were like, "Are you sure this isn't a snuff film?" <laughs> like, it was very funny, you know, that they thought it was because you know usually you shoot things out of order in, in features and. Uh, mm -hmm. And for some reason, my last day was my death scene, and they were sure because you know, I said we're never going to see our son again. <laughs> I said it's a Paramount movie; they're cool. We're fine, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but of course, it wasn't uh, a problem, and um, yeah, and then and they loved actually seeing the movie, but they they did turn away at my death scene. Well, they don't want to see their baby boy getting no. killed like that. No. Uh, especially, I also wonder what, okay, so I wanted to talk about your character a little bit because you were such a nice guy and like you're, you know, not the most upstanding person in the movie. Right. <laughs> you know, I, you're, I, you're a little bit sleazy and, uh, and uh, so I wonder like how do you turn that on when you're such a nice guy? And also, like, what did your parents think about it? What did you know, your girlfriends think about it when they saw you, like, acting like this totally different person? Well, I, I, that's the fun of that part, that, you know, he is actually a nice guy. He comes out very nice, you know, a scene with Muffin the dog. Oh, yes, I love, love, love Muffin. Yeah, great time. Uh, and he's charming and all, but he's there really, like most of the campers or the counselors, to get laid. Right. He attaches in, you know, right away to Kirsten's character. Who and, who is the best pick, by the way? <laughs> yes. She is the number one pick. If you know, if that would if I was that was my persuasion, that would be my pick. Uh -huh. Yes. But uh so you know, it was fun to as I said, to have that, you know, the dichotomy of being a nice guy yet still being a little sleazy. Mm. And that's just funny, you know, you you draw on things you've seen in your life, you know, other people that are sleazy, a cat <laughs> that are sleazy. Um, we all have sleazy friends, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so, OK, uh, working with Steve Miner, because I know, you know, he eventually kind of, you know, wanted to get away from Friday the 13th. But at this point, he was pretty new with it. So um, how was it working with him? It was great. I love Steve. It was the first time I had worked with Steve and he was very generous, you know, with us as actors. You know, we we're all a young group of actors. Many of us were just beginning our careers. And so you needed someone that could guide you, but also make you feel very, very comfortable and secure. And he did that. And that's really something any actor wants. 
And he was also fun. We all had fun. The whole cast was fun as well as Steve. But uh, he let us goof off and and, uh, and enjoy ourselves because it was important that we all felt as if we were a unit. You know, we were counselors working together at, at this camp. And it was important that we appeared that way and giving us the ability to play off of each other and have some fun. And of course, off the set, too, uh, really made us bond. And I think that was that, that is really important. And I, that was the next question I was going to ask you. So who did you really like uh, get along with the most? Like, and are there any like funny backstories like of you like partying and, you know, you just who you really gravitated to and like the fun stuff that you did behind the scenes well, besides Muffin, of course. Uh, yeah. Muffin. <laughs> I really can't pick anyone in particular because most of the stuff we did, we were always in group settings. So mm -hmm. we went to that roadhouse to that bar, even though we weren't in the scene, a bunch of us were in the bar or somewhere else drinking and having a good time watching the stuff being filmed. Um, we all just got along and, and there were no prima donnas. Everyone was there to make it work as a team, which is great. And so no one was disliked. I can't think of anyone that I disliked. Uh, everyone had a good sense of humor. Uh, we're all different people, which is great. That's, that's what made it work. But uh, it just... Well, like, yeah, nice. Stu Stuart, for one. I mean, he is a different guy. Yeah, um, out there, and his character was, was great. He's great, yeah. He's also in just one of the guys, which is one of my favorite... Um, like 80s teen comedies. He's like the weirdo that likes lizards and he's yeah. great in that. So, he's yeah, he's, just, <laughs> he's a lot of fun. Um, okay. So, I wanted to also ask about um, uh, Marta. Co I think her, you pronounce it Marta Cober. Is that how you pronounce her name? So, um, because I know that she was kind of gone. Uh, you know, like no one could find her for a long time, but then now she's kind of shown up again at some of the conventions. Um, what is that like? Because she was gone for so long. So, well, you know, a lot of them do a lot of conventions. I personally have maybe done three in the mm -hmm. last 15 years. So they all see each other at these conventions. They get to see each other, which is great. Um, and when I do them, and I like to do them only occasionally, I also think it's more interesting for me to do it that way and not be overexposed constantly. Um, and that works well for me, but for them, they, they like doing them more often. But when I saw Marta, it was great. It was, it was like, it was, you know, what was it? This 81. And we made this thing, I believe. Yeah. And then she kind of dropped off the map. I, you know, yeah. yeah. But uh, it was great to see her and she was, she was very nice at the convention. In fact, I think it was, it was one of the big anniversaries or something. So they had a lot, almost everyone from our, uh, from our, Part two was in Minneapolis for this convention. And it was it was nice. It was really nice to see each other. And I've heard Amy Steele is just like a dream. The guy from the Hysteria Continues, Nathan, you know, she helped with his engagement and everything. I just, you uh, know, she's also my favorite final girl. So, <laughs> yeah, she's terrific. And John Curry's great. You know, they, of course, play the opposite of each other. And yes, I would see them occasionally in L.A. at local signings. Um, and we always got along. But, you know, everyone has their own life. Um, they see each other at these things and perhaps some talk to each other. Uh, but, you know, you, you do a movie, you do a project, and it's at the very beginning when it's over, a lot of people stay in touch. But as your life goes on, you go on to different projects. You work with different casts and crews. And, you know, I did a soap opera for three years, and, and they became my family, truly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I can see that. I I watch Real Housewives, so um, Eileen, uh, Eileen Davis was on it, and uh, – yeah. Lisa Rinna. And so like, yeah, you can tell they're like, I mean, you're like basically a workhorse on that, on those shows. <laughs> like you work all the time. What, so, are they, what are they doing to their faces on that show? Um, uh, A lot. They are doing a lot of things. <laughs> like, or yesterday it was like, I thought I was watching a wax museum. I'm just, oh, mm -hmm. how, how they, they, they feel they have to keep going and going and going and changing their look. You don't even know who you're looking at anymore. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know what they see in the mirror because it's like, I don't, I, I, it just doesn't look real. So, but I still watch the show for the drama, you know, okay. whatever. <laughs> um, okay, so another person, Walt Gorney, did you get to talk to him? No, I never actually met Walt. Oh, because he seemed like just a great guy. I mean, they really should have kept him on for the rest of the movies, I think. But 
everyone that met him uh, said the same thing that he was terrific and uh, and very funny. They said but no, he I, did. He did do the narration in his real accent for part seven, I believe. Like he narrates the beginning of the movie. Yeah, I would have so, liked, it, but I didn't have that chance. He seemed like he was, uh, you know, not a crazy guy, really. No, no, everyone said <laughs> <laughs> just funny. Yeah, that's what he seemed like to me. I really liked him. I thought he was a big part of the movie. Um, so, okay, do you think Paul died? So, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so, but my answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> because I, I heard somewhere that there was, a, like, someone had a copy of some, some of the script, and on the back of one of the pages it says, Paul is dead. But well, that, they might have they just been talking about Paul McCartney. I really I don't know. I was just going to so. say that that sounds exactly like a tagline from that whole uh, thing that was going around about Paul McCartney. Yeah, yeah. so who knows what they That's were really the, talking about. Yeah. I <laughs> hope he's alive. So, um, Okay, so I, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm really sorry it's taken more than I, I, Not at all. Not at all. Um, I expected. But um, I only have a little bit about how uh, he knows you're alone. Um and I hope I say his name right because I've heard it a million times. But Armand Mastriani. Very close. Mastri Mastriani. Yep. Is that it? Okay. Um, what? Well, okay. I've heard. I've had interviews with him. He sounds nice. Uh, what? How was he? And was he similar at all to Steve Miner, like in how he directed? Well, to be honest, that was so many years ago. It's really hard. Yeah, because that was before uh, Friday the Thirteenth. So. It was prior to that, yes. And, and that was the first feature I ever booked. And, of course, I'm only in the first, you know, five, six minutes of it. It's kind of a movie within the movie. You right, think, but you make such an impression. I always, like, I'm always like Russell Todd, yes. Because <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> you're always the best looking one in the movie. <laughs> like, but uh, I enjoyed that a lot because you know, I was very excited. It was my first movie, and here I am, you know, doing this. And it was Tom Hanks' first movie, I believe. Right? And yeah, so he. I, I, he's I didn't know who he young. was. And, very uh, young. Yeah. Whatever happened to him? I don't know. You know, like he didn't really seem to do anything after that. Oh no, it just fizzled out. Yeah, uh, you know that's really sad because he had a lot of potential. <laughs> <laughs> we shot that in Staten on Staten Island in New York, and. Um, it was just pretty much in one scene and one night, and that was all I had to do with it. And where exactly was uh, Friday the 13th, too? It was in New York or New Jersey, right? No, we actually shot it in Kent, Connecticut. At a, at a oh, lake. really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. We all got bussed up from New York City and uh, stayed up at this actual camp setting. That sounds fun. I think they did that for the first one, too, because I remember uh, Tom Savini talking about. Where did they shoot that? Out there. Uh, I think that one was in New York. Oh, that was, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, OK. Um, I swear I'm almost done. <laughs> um, so the releases of both of those movies, I know you weren't in He Knows You're Alone as much, but I know they both got pretty big releases. Um how how did they compare for you? Did you go to the release for He Knows You're Alone? I don't believe I actually went to the premiere for He Knows You're Alone. I did for okay. Friday Night Lights Part 2, uh, but uh, he, he Knows You're Alone, I just had to watch like everyone else in the theater. So what was Friday the 13th Part 2 like? Because I bet it was insane. The premiere? Yeah. I Again, it's so long ago. I can't <laughs> tell you one thing about it, unfortunately. You know, it was... 81 or eight, we shot in 81. I don't know if it came out in 81 or 82, but we, we shot it in 81. And um, I just don't recall at all. Yeah. So were you, you, were you, did you have any, you know, drinks or anything while you were watching? <laughs> um, but I remember, you know, watching the movie, but as far as the party, I don't remember anything. I'm sure I had a couple of drinks at the party. Yeah, of course you have to. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, my last question before I talk just a little bit about the work you do right now, because I've read so many great things about it. Um, uh, what modern films have you enjoyed? And are there any directors that you would like to work with now, like as an actor? Hmm, good question. Um, films I've enjoyed. Uh, La La Land, which recently came, you know, last year. Mm -hmm. That was terrific. Uh, it's so rare that you... 
you know, get a musical that, you know, and, and, uh, and I thought that was really well done. Um, I'd love to work with Martin Scorsese, uh, Spielberg, oh, yeah. mm. Quentin Tarantino. Uh, and even, he's from, he's from Knoxville. So oh, really, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Tim Burton, um, Coppola. I mean, they're all fantastic directors, of course. Love to Chris Nolan. Uh, but you know, I'm no, I'm no longer acting. So right. uh, it's not, but you do, you do get to work with them. Correct. Like in a way. Well, it's true. I supply, I do literally supply the steady cam operators and camera operators for their films and TV shows. So, you know, I've never left the, uh, the industry. In fact, I, I truly enjoy this more than anything I've ever done. I, you know, it, it's truly my calling. I really love owning my company and being an agent and, uh, and taking care of my clients. Well, I did do some digging and I did find this about, um, I found some weird, I don't know where I got, I went into a rabbit hole about um, your agency uh-huh. and there was like a blog of people talking, There, it started off with someone asking, hey, what's this guy like, you know, would you work with him, I'm thinking about him, whatever, and um, these are two of the things that I read and I was like, wow, um, so someone said he's very good at what he does without being overbearing or pushy and you will never have a complaint from a UPM or producer, I think this is a very important point as you don't want someone to represent you that alienates you before the job even starts or causes the producer to want to hire someone next, someone else for the next job because they don't like dealing with your agent. Um, and then Russell, Russell is a top-notch negotiator. He has done deals for me that I couldn't have done on my own. For me, he has more than paid for himself over the years, both with better deals um, and with the stress relief of not having to deal with production at all until I'm on the job. And he finds you work. Oh, and I was just like... That's wonderful to hear. There was nothing bad that anyone had to say. I mean, it was, it was all like, he's like my family. He's like my best friend. So, like, I, there was not one negative thing. That's great. Well, you, you know, no one can please everyone. So no one should ever attempt to do that. But you just live your life the way you do. And, you know, again, I love what I do. And I guess, you know, it shows and it works based on what they're saying. And, um and that's just really, uh, you know, the best way to live is is treat people kindly and fairly. Although when you negotiate, obviously you have to be strong. Mm-hmm. But, it's true, but I think, not in a bad way. You can be you can be firm and not rude. Well, I, well, one of the things I've learned after literally, I just celebrated my twentieth year of my company. So uh, wow, I'm very happy and proud about that. But you learn how to talk to people. When I first started, you know, I was always very nervous. You know, negotiating here I was talking to. UPMs or unit production managers and and uh, and sometimes directors and directors of photography making deals and it was nerve wracking. But once you realize that, um, you know, you truly are on equal footing with these people, you're just doing different jobs um, and you get more comfortable speaking with them and you know more about your craft and what you're talking about that uh, it really is is uh, something that um, is not horrible to or difficult to do it, it's just it's it takes it takes um a lot of organization to be an agent it takes um negotiating skills but i think above all it, it takes a personality that mm-hmm. I have yeah. that, and that others uh have as well that uh you know people enjoy dealing with you i think that's crucial and i learned you never ever get emotional on a call when you're talking about numbers or anything because then you've Ooh, lost. you're you are right on that <laughs> i've heard producers get emotional um and then they kind of pull back as they realize this is not working but if you just have a civil conversation we always come to some agreement so you know it works so can you name like are you allowed to name any of like the big projects like your top three big projects that you've you know been the agent for the camera operator for We've done all uh, the Transformer movies. My camera operators, Steadicam, did all almost all of them. Almost all the Hunger Games, almost every major TV series that you see. One of my clients has either been on it full time or came into day play. You know, coming in and out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, I I go to Netflix. And what about Stranger Things? Uh, yes, I had someone on that. Brief. Oh yay! Yeah, yeah, but uh, well, literally, you know. It, it, so many. I mean, it's just it's just wild. Uh, and, you know, I've got clients in New York, in Florida, in California, in Canada, in Australia, in um, Puerto Rico, in South America, um, in Chicago, um, in other states in the U.S. So, 
you know, a lot of times they don't want to bring someone in from out of town because it's more expensive. You have to pay idle days. You have to pay airfare, ship the gear, hotel per diem. But if they're local, of course, it saves them money. So it's nice to have people, you know, all over the country. Right. Well, I am so amazed by you. And um, I will let you know this. Whenever there is a Facebook like poll and they do them a lot of uh, like, you know, who is the hottest uh person in a friday the 13th and you're always in there but some people are like i don't i don't know he's kind of a sleaze bag and i but but i i'm, I'm always like who cares <laughs> i'm like he is up there i don't care what you say well, it's always usually you and uh and your um kirsten baker so oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that's fine no, that, that's nice to hear. <laughs> so anyway thank you so so much for doing this for me and this was my first interview so i hope that it sounded okay. Um, I was super nervous. So, <laughs> got some good questions. You sound terrific, and uh, you handled it wonderfully. So, uh, I think you should do many, many more. So, but you're just amazing to talk to, and I'm I'm just over the moon. I'm this is just like a dream come true for me. So, that's for you, Emily. I appreciate that very much, and best of luck with everything. And uh, thank you for doing this too. It was fun. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.